Jack Cole, who is one of the founding members of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And Jack, how long has it been since you've been involved in law enforcement? Well, I'm still involved in law enforcement, just on the other side. If you want to know how long it's been since I retired, it was 1991. And how long was it after you retired that you decided that you'd be forming Law Enforcement Against Prohibition? It was another 10 years, actually. I, I uh, first went to get my education, I didn't. I flunked out of high school, so I had to get my college and master's and I spent seven years in a PhD program, which I didn't finish. By the way. But uh, and the reason I didn't finish it, this, these ideas were cooking in our minds anyway, and in 2002, uh, MPP, Marijuana Policy Project, got the right idea to send out letters to any police that they had seen in the newspapers speaking against the war on drugs, offering all of them uh, $50,000 of startup money for any organization of current or former police who would call for the decriminalization of one ounce of marijuana. And uh, I called up Peter Christ. Peter Christ is the guy that had the idea for LEAP. He wanted to create an organization uh, modeled after Vietnam veterans against the war. Because he said when those folks came home from that terrible war and started speaking out against it, you know, you might not even agree with what they had to say, but nobody could argue with them. You know, been there, done that. How do you argue with that? And we have the same credibility when it comes to speaking uh, against the drug war. So I quit my PhD program and I thought uh, I better grab this $50,000 so that we can actually start this organization now. And that's what I did. Uh, and for the first eight years I was executive director of it. After four years, I was feeling a little burnt out and wanted to get another executive director. But it takes a long time to find a fool. <laughs> And by that I mean getting paid almost nothing to work 80 hours a week. And that's what we, we put in as executive director of this. So finally I found uh, Neil Franklin, who's a retired major, Maryland State Police. Got a better resume than I do, actually. He also worked undercover in narcotics. And he's very, very moved to do this. So he, like, like, there's 60,000 of us, by the way. There are 60,000 police, judges, prosecutors, prison wards. We've got DEA and FBI agents and supporters in 86 countries. So this is just going, developing so fast. We even have elite branches now in other countries now. We have elite branch in Australia, Brazil, Canada, Costa Rica. Czech Republic, Poland, United Kingdom. What changes in culture, both American and global, have you seen in regards to prohibition in general since you've uh, been involved with law enforcement against prohibition? The changes are truly immense. Uh, when we started this, we were hoping that we might convince 10, maybe 15 percent of our audience. I mean, we thought that would be stretching it. And we thought we were creating an organization that would be around for generations. Within a month, two months of when we started, we were convincing 80% of our audience, no matter where we went in the world. 80% of our audience. And I'm not talking about uh, going to something like this where a lot of these folks want to use some of the soft drugs. I'm talking about going to uh, things like Rotary Clubs, Lions Clubs, Chambers of Commerce, very conservative folks. And those folks, after 30 minutes of hearing from us, 80% of them agree with us. Even law enforcers. We started going to uh, law enforcement conferences six years ago, uh, national and international conferences of police, of judges, of prosecutors, of uh, 
even DEA. And we try to get a, a speaking engagement there, but whether we get a speaking engagement or not, we set up a, a uh, educational display booth in the vendor section and put a couple of speakers down there. We're very aggressive. I tell all our speakers, you don't sit or stand behind that table because if you do, you're only going to talk to the people who are already on our side. So we're really aggressive. We stand out in the aisle. Anybody who comes down the aisle so much as looks at us, we got them by the elbow saying, hey, you heard about law enforcement against prohibition war cops too. Let us talk to you about this war on drugs. And then we take very keep very careful track of their reactions and we find that less than 1% refuse to talk to us. And of the others that do talk to us, the last thing we say to them, and, and these are very short conversations, I'd say three, five minutes at the longest, the last thing all of our speakers are supposed to say to them is, so wh what do you think? Does this argument have any merit? Do you agree with us now that we should end the war on drugs, treat drug abuse as a health problem? Or do you want to continue the war on drugs? Or, third, have we at least made it so you're undecided? Whichever one of those three things they, they choose, we put it down on a scratch pad, and at the end of the day, and the conference, we total it up. We couldn't believe our, the totals we were getting at first, but it's held absolutely true for every conference, and that is that uh, after they talk to us, 80% of law enforcers agree with us. 80%. Only 6% want to continue the war on drugs, and 14% undecided. So things are changing tremendous, but they don't change until somebody hears the argument. That's We've been the missing link all the time, you know? You can get a, a, a dedicated college professor or a, or a defense attorney or somebody to get up there and say exactly the same words we say. And they just don't convince that many people. And the reason they don't convince them is because the first thing the public wants to do is say, ah, they just want to get high. And they don't hear a word after that, sir. Well, they can't accuse us of that. We spent our whole adult lives working to reduce drug abuse. And we haven't changed our mind about that. We still think we're out there fighting to reduce drug abuse. We just figured a much better way to do it. The war on drugs creates drug abuse. The war on drugs creates more people using drugs. It's good to hear that law enforcement against prohibition has such success in getting law enforcement to agree uh, in what seems to be kind of like a secret ballot that they uh, have considered an alternative to the war on drugs. But my question is, it seems that there are no current speakers that I'm aware of for Law Enforcement Against Prohibition who are involved in the drug war actively. Oh, um, yes, there are. I'm aware of a, uh, in New Hampshire, there's at least a... Uh, how, how would a chief of police be? Chief of police, that's good to hear. Uh, how many... We have a chief of police in Connecticut. It's a working chief of police. He's, he's a, a speaker for lead. We have uh, a prison superintendent in New Hampshire. Yes, Cheshire S County. Not only a speaker for, for LEAP, he's on our board of directors. And he is doing so well up there, he was just awarded the, uh, the, the best superintendent in the state award when they got together all the superintendents. It's, it's a real plus for him that he's a member of LEAP. And I think this is, this is the way it's going to start going, you know. People aren't going to see it as, as were they outsiders. They're going to say, hey, these people are finally making sense, and people are going to be trying to get aboard. Not just the public, but law enforcement. While we're chasing around all these basically young people, basically people of color, and arresting them for you know, dipping and dabbing in drugs, uh, non-violent drug use, uh, all this sort of thing. Well, while the police are spending all our time doing that, if you look at the clearance rate for major crimes in the United States, you see it is dismal, dismal. Four out of every 10 murders are unsolved in this country. Six out of every 10 reported rapes go unsolved. Reported ro uh, arsons go unsolved. 75% of all reported robberies are unsolved. And 90% of all reported home burglaries at night, when people break into your house, you don't know why you're there to try to sleep, are 
unsolved, 90%. What's the date here? And I say reported because so many people have just given up on the police. They know we're just not doing the job, so they don't even bother to report them. They just take their loss, you know. Let me point out to you that in 1963, before we had a war on drugs, our police in this country were correctly credited with solving 91% of the murders. Today we solve 61%. So what happened? Did we suddenly become incompetent? No. We're just putting all our time and energy into chasing around nonviolent drug offenders. And you only, you know, we only have a finite amount of time and officers. When you turn them all on this thing, you can't be protecting citizens from violent predators, from child molesters, from things that really count. And what we say at LEAP is, let us get back to doing what we should have been doing in the first place, what we used to do, protecting you from me and me from some other person, that's our job. Our job should not be protecting every adult human being from him or herself by saying, we're not going to let you put this in your body even if you think it's okay. That shouldn't be our job. And it's only when we're assigned that kind of task that suddenly, suddenly we start stomping on people's constitutional rights and civil rights. We, we start ignoring the, the Fourth Amendment uh, for search and seizure. We start lying on the on the stand when we're, when we're in court, you know? It's because this has become such a numbers game. It's literally a numbers game for police. Police, sadly, get promoted by the number of arrests they make. And they don't, do not, do not ever get promoted by the number of convictions they make. Now what does that mean? That means they can go out and make any kind of damn arrest they want that they know they'll never get a conviction on, and yet it's a digit for them, right? But what does it mean to that person that got arrested? They got a record for the rest of their life. And when a cop stops you in your car, and the first thing they say is license registration, sir, you hand it to them and they say, just a moment, I'll be right back. And they go back to the car and disappear for about five minutes, right? What they're doing is calling in your name and your, your date of birth. And, and very quickly, they get a reply. And you know what that reply is? It's the number of arrests you've had. Nothing about convictions, the number of arrests. So if, if a cop arrests somebody for some foolish thing, they're labeled for life even if they were found not guilty afterwards. We gotta change this. This, I, I, there are so many harms, you just can't enumerate them without taking several hours to talk about it. Harms that most people don't even imagine, unless you actually worked in that field. And then there's the, the thing that I had my own addiction. So. And my addiction, sadly, was the adrenaline rush. Boy, the adrenaline rush for being able to outthink these people and bring them down is amazing.